All right, we are ready to go. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew is where we're going to be. What I want us to cover this quarter, and maybe longer, is uh, I want us to go through the New Testament, and it'll be a little bit of a fly-through, but I want us to study each book of the Bible individually and kind of do a survey of each book. So you know there's 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, and I want us to see how they each fit together and what it is that the author of each uh, book is trying to get across to us. Sometimes uh, we fail to see the forest cause the trees. You ever heard that saying? And we tend to look at a verse or a verse and a chapter and a chapter. And I want us to kind of take a step back and run through these books and see exactly what's trying to be put across to us. So what you have in your hands, if you have one of those little sheets, is an outline of the book of Matthew and a covering of a lot of the different aspects. Of course, you could spend a lot of time on Matthew, and we have before. And we probably won't get to all the things which are there on the back and the front today, but we'll see the basic gist of what the book is about. Remember, there are four Gospels, right? You got <laughs> Gospels, you got history, you got epistles, and then you got prophecy, right? Four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You got history, which is the book of Acts. From Romans all the way over to uh, Philemon, you had the, what's called the Pauline epistles, books written by Paul. Then you had the general epistles, books written or letters written by everybody but Paul, starting with Hebrews and going through Jude. And then you have the Revelation or the, uh, the ending, it would be a different way for us to put it, written by John, which closes up the book. Now, Matthew focuses on Jesus from a different aspect of the other three writers of the Gospels. And he looks at Jesus from the aspect of the great rabbi, the great teacher. If you go a book earlier than Matthew, you see the fella, sometimes I call him the Italian prophet Malachi, but he's Malachi, right? And we study Malachi, and Malachi talks in his last chapter about there's one who is coming. We know him as John the Baptizer. And he is coming, and there's going to be the fulfillment and God is going to care for his people as soon as his people truly repent. And so Malachi ends, and how long is it from Malachi to Matthew, or the New Testament? 400 years, okay? 400 years of silence which are there. Now for us, that's a blank page or maybe two blank pages in our Bible. In world history, you talk about movement. When you're in Malachi, you've just seen the uh, apex of the Persian Empire. The people are back at home. They're working on rebuilding the temple. They're working on putting everything back together. Historically, chronologically, Malachi and the book of Nehemiah are happening at the same time. And so you're in that area. Now the Persians will fall. Now the Greeks will come through. Now the, well, the Persians will fall. And then the Greeks will come through, of course. And then you'll have what's called the Maccabean period, which is the Jewish independent period. Then the Romans will come through, and then it's time for the days of Jesus. And we see that in Galatians 4.4, 4, where it talks about how God came in the fullness of time, or the completion of the time in which he was ready to come. And so Matthew opens up great, because he is a bridge back to the Old Testament. Because what you'll notice as we run through Matthew is the use of prophecy. And what we'll see with Matthew is over and over and over, he says, listen, Jesus said this, which is a fulfillment of this prophecy in the Old Testament. Jesus did this, which is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. And so Matthew works as a bridge, but Matthew is also a collection of sermons to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. Because no man spoke as this man spoke. We'll see that in Matthew chapter 7. And we see that Matthew really is a collection of five sermons. And each one of these sermons works great individually to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the great teacher, the great rabbi. And so that's how the book is put together, is through these five sermons. At the end of each sermon, we'll see where the writing or the phrase is, after he had said these things, after he had preached these things. In other words, this is the end of the lesson. This is a complete ending of everything that can be said on the subject. And so that's kind of how the book of Matthew works together. Now let's look at it just as a glance. It's written to a Jewish audience. We see that because it uh, comes across 
explaining so much of the Old Testament and the prophecies and things which are there. We think more or less it's probably written around 50 A.D. I've seen some people go before to around 48. Some people go all the way later to about 55 or so. Now, why do we know that? We know that because the way in which he talks about the temple in a prophetic way in Matthew chapter 24 about the destruction of the temple. We know that because the audience for which it's written doesn't fit the 30s, doesn't fit the early 40s. It fits best somewhere around 50 or the mid-50s as you go across. Now, what's the key word of the book of Matthew you see on your sheet? Kingdom. Kingdom. All right. 28 times we read about the word kingdom. The kingdom comes through, which is showing Jesus not only as a master teacher, but is also what? He's the king. You open up the book of Matthew, and you see the genealogy. That's what you make people read when you don't like them in church. You know, hey, what's a, a scripture reading? You look at the guy, if you don't like him, you make him read the genealogy, right? I'm just joking about that. If I ever actually do make somebody read the genealogy, it's not really because I don't like them. But you see those big, fancy words. You see three groups of 14, which show it's a way in which to help people memorize it. Three groups of 14, and they all focus going back to David and going back to Abraham. Focusing on Jesus being king upon the true kingdom and the way in which the kingdom will work. So it proves Jesus is a king, it references Old Testament prophecy, and this is the only one of the four Gospels, which is surprising. It's the only one of the four Gospels which discusses the church. Okay, Matthew 16, 18, after Jesus had heard Peter give the good confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he says, well, have you said, Peter... Flesh and blood did not, reveal this again, uh, did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell or the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Going over to the next chapter, chapter 18. If a brother sins against you, what do you need to do? First go to whom? The brother. The brother. Make those things right. If it still doesn't work, go find somebody who both of you respect Find witnesses and bring them, and then what? Go see them. And if that doesn't work, bring the matter before whom? The church, okay? So Matthew is written at a time in which the church is something which exists. It's written at a time in which people would understand this word church. And it's interesting, he's the only one of the four Gospels to really discuss the church. We'll see the church discussed much more in the book of Acts. Something else that's fun about the book of Matthew, a lot of basic Christian doctrine is found here because of the focus on him being rabbi, right? Marriage, divorce, and remarriage, Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 9, right? Uh, the end times, prophecies concerning the end times, Matthew 24, Matthew 25. Many of the uh, parables are found there in Matthew chapter 13. Basic Christian doctrine is found throughout the book of Matthew, and so Matthew it looks like it was written to be designed to be read in a church service. Uh, they call this, in uh, backgrounds of this, uh, liturgical. In other words, it was designed to be read in a church service. So somebody would read chapter 2 one week in church. The next week somebody would read Matthew 16. And as you read through it, you see where it's designed very well to teach those lessons in that way. You see those powers of three that come through. There's three generations, each one of 14 mentioned. The three temptations, what are they? Make these stones become bread. What did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone. Well, Jesus, you're the son of God. The scriptures teach that he's not going to let anything happen to you. So why don't you get up on the pinnacle of the temple, which was about three stories at the time, one of the tallest structures in the world. Why don't you get up on that pinnacle of the temple and jump off? And God will catch you and everybody will know that you're the son of God. What does Jesus say? You shall not tempt the Lord your God, right? The third uh, temptation which is there. Jesus, if you will just fall down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms which are around, every kingdom which exists. And he says, get behind me, Satan. It is written, you shall not, what? You, you can only worship the Lord your God, right? You worship the Lord and serve him only. You see those three temptations which are there. 
Matthew's an obvious preacher because everything comes in three. They're not always a poem, but everything comes in three. All right, three illustrations of righteousness, prohibitions, and three commands. It's found in Matthew 6, uh, 1 and Matthew 7. And also each time uh, as you go from chapter 8 to chapter 9, there's a cycle. There's a, a healing, there's a power, and there's restoration. And there's healing, a show of his power, and a restoration. A healing, a show of his power, and his restoration. So you see, he's put this together in a way in which shows each one of these things happening. Now let's look at these five sermons, okay? Go ahead and run in your Bible to chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Okay. And seeing the multitudes, this is chapter 5, verse 1. He went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Now we see the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the humble or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed uh, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. All right, we've gone through that acrostic. Uh, it's a chiastic acrostic is what it is in the Hebrew. And he starts from there, and he defines from chapter 5 and chapter 7 what the daily life of a Christian is. And so as he starts his first sermon, what he's saying is, listen, if you're a Christian, this is what you look like. This is your appearance as a Christian. And speaking of being a Christian and trying to save my life, I need to pass this around before I get in trouble. All right, write your favorite church song on here. And that's what we'll sing at our uh, last, uh, you know, at the last of each month where we go through. I'll pass this around. If it's really hard, we'll have Matt lead it, okay? All right, let me go ahead and start here. And then if you need help passing it back, I can help you as you go across. All right, so we start here in Matthew chapter 5, and we see the Beatitudes. Your attitude that you should have in order to find true happiness and true fulfillment. And then we go into talking about the difference between what the Pharisees did and what true followers of Christ are going to do, right? All right? The Pharisees would say, listen, you love your friend, but you hate your enemy. What's Jesus say about that? But I say unto you, love whom? Do you have to love your enemies? That's hard, isn't it? That's difficult to love your enemy. Okay. Uh, the rabbis will say to you, you shall not commit adultery. He says, but I say to you, do not even look, right? Because that's adultery Where? In your heart, right? And he goes through and he says, It has been said, but I say to you to be this way. And then he goes into chapter 7. He starts talking about what real Christianity looks like. And as he goes into that, he says, Listen, you know, um, there's a wide and narrow way, right? Verses 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, the difficult way. Because wide is a way and easy is a way that leads to what? Destruction. There are many people who find it. But you enter into that difficult and narrow way because that's the key to eternal life. In other words, following Jesus is going to be hard. But is it worth it? It absolutely is worth it. Okay? He says, those who hear my words and does them, the man who hears my words and does them, it's like a man who builds his house. First person hears the words but doesn't do them. And his house is built on what? Sand. And it may look beautiful, it may look just right, but what happens when the winds and the waves come up? It falls apart, doesn't it? But those who hear the words of Jesus and those who do them, it's like their house has a foundation. Their house will not be moved. And no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, that way will always lead to eternal life. Now look in chapter 7 and verse 28. Let me flip over there. In 7 and verse 28, what's it say? 
And so it was when Jesus had what? Finished these sayings, the people were astonished because he taught them as one having what? Authority, okay? And not like the scribes which are there. All right, so now that we've finished this sermon talking about how Jesus is greater, what are we going to do? We'll have a flurry of miracles. Look in chapter 8, we cleanse a leper. Look in chapter 8, verse 5, we heal the centurion's servant. Look in chapter 8, verse 14, the mother-in-law is healed. Okay, many are healed after sunset. So we go through each one of these, and what are we proving? Is Jesus the master rabbi? Yes, because he has the miracles to heal, to show his authority that no one is like him. Now we crank up and get ready for chapter 10. Chapter 10 is the sermon about the church, right? So to get us ready for this sermon, suddenly we see in chapter 8, verse 18, where he starts talking about the cost of discipleship. We look in verse 23, and we see the winds and the waves, they obey Jesus. We see in verse 28, the demons are, uh, begin to listen to Jesus. We see him where he heals a paralytic. We see where he knows about fasting and things such as that. So then we get to chapter 10. And as we're in chapter 10, we begin our next sermon, and our next sermon is called the Missionary Sermon. And it's where he begins to send his men out to teach them about how they are going to speak to other people. And so we start here in chapter 11, and he says, listen, you're going to go, and you're going to prepare the way for the gospel. Now, there are going to be some who are impenitent. There are going to be some who do not want to hear, and some who do not want to obey, Kind of like today, isn't it? And so he goes through, and let's look at some of the things that he says. Okay? Look at chapter 10, verse 5. Don't go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter the city of the Samaritans. But go to whom? Verse 6. The house of Israel. And he says, okay, you go into them, and you begin to speak. And he says, have faith. They're going to take care of you. But if they don't receive your words, verse 14, shake the dust off your feet. Don't waste your time. It's going to be better for the folks in Sodom and Gomorrah than it is for them. He says, verse 16, you're a bunch of sheep headed into the presence of wolves. Be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. He says, whatever you say in the dark, verse 27, speak in the light. What you hear in your ear, preach in the housetops. Don't fear those who can kill the body, but fear those who can do what? Destroy the soul. Okay, and you see the cup of water and all these things. Now look at chapter 11, verse 1. We see the set end of this sermon. When it came to pass, when Jesus had finished commanding his disciples, see there's the ending, he says, now you go and you teach and you preach. And we see the after part of that sermon as he says, woe to those impenitent cities, as he shows he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and as he shows the way in which to go. Now we go to chapter 13, and we begin the next sermon, which is the Sermon of the Parables. And we're going to have the longest list of parables right in a row of anywhere in the Gospels. Now, what is a parable? Earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? Sometimes we see things best when we see a story that illustrates it, right? Uh, the word parable, okay? Para means alongside Bole means to throw something. It means to throw something down next to something else to give you perspective. All right? I like to fish, but I'm a terrible fisherman, which is okay because I don't want to clean fish. All right? Whenever I catch a fish, I want to take a picture. But I'll stand here, and the camera will be here, and I'll hold my fish right there. That's right. I don't hold them that way because usually I can hold them in my hand. But I'll put the fish right next to the camera lens and it looks like I'm holding a whale. Okay? You got to learn just how to hold that angle just right. Sometimes if you're looking at something, especially something small, what you'll do is you'll put a quarter or something that somebody can relate to right next to it and it gives you perspective of what the true size is there. That is a parable, to throw something alongside it to give you perspective which is there. You see, we can talk all day about how a person's heart is, right? You need to have a good heart. You need to have a pure heart. Well, Jesus throws down a parable to give an illustration. He says, there's a man who walks out and he casts seed upon the soils. This is out of Luke 4. Some falls on the sidewalk. If seed's on the sidewalk, is it going to take root? Not very well, is it? 
He says that's how it is for a man who has a hard heart. The seed, the gospel is just going to sit there until Satan figures out a way to get rid of it. He said there's some who throw out that seed and the seed falls upon the thorny soil. And it's able to grow quickly, much like the gardens are right now. You drive up and down the road, you see beautiful gardens. A lot of those gardens, in about three weeks, people are lazy. They're not going to get out there and hoe and till and everything else. And what's going to happen to that garden? Everything's going to grow up, right? And that garden won't last. In about a month, they'll just mow it and pretend it never happened. Right? Okay? Some falls on the thorny soil is going to get choked out. That's what happens when you want to follow the church, but you get too busy for church. The devil may not make you bad, but he will make you busy. And there's a lot of people not here at church today because they've got this going on or that going on because they're too busy. There's some who throw the soil out and it falls on good soil, but it's shallow because there's rocks right underneath it. And it can sprout up, but if the ground's not tilled, the ground's not taken care of, the roots will never be established. And what happens in July when it's high? It's not going to work. There's a lot of shallow Christians, people who look faithful, but what's going to happen when bad days come? And are bad days coming? All who wish to live godly in Christ Jesus will face what? Persecution. Those people are going to fall away. Now, that's totally different than me just saying, hey, y'all need to have a good heart and listen to the sermon. Jesus throws down that parable to give an explanation of what these things are going to look like. And so when you run into Matthew 13, you see these parables and you see the master teacher coming across and putting these things through as you go along. Now we get to chapter 18. As we get to chapter 18, we see what's called the church sermon, right? And we begin explaining what the church is. Now, we're not quite there in chapter 18 because we begin introducing the church in chapter 16, right? Chapter 16, let me me start in the front. Chapter 16, right, starting in verse 1, Jesus begins talking to the men. And he says, well, who do men say that I am? And some people say, well, you are John the Baptist, or you're Elijah, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He says, sounds good, but who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So chapter 16, and verse 18 that we just discussed. Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And we start the sermon going into chapter 18 talking about the church, explaining, not like Acts, how you get to be a part of the church necessarily, but explaining what the church is going to look like and how the church is going to behave. Chapter 17, we see the transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Get to chapter 18, talking about the church. Who's the most important person in the church? Who is the greatest? Verse 4 of chapter 18, whoever humbles himself like a little what? Child. What's that mean that you have to humble yourself as a child to be great in the kingdom? Innocence? Innocent, not putting up a front. Right. You, you, see him and that's, that's him. you get a little five year old kid. What's that kid's opinion of his daddy? My daddy can do anything. My daddy can whoop your daddy, right? Okay, right? Uh, You get a little girl, what's her opinion of her mama? My mama is beautiful, right? We have to have that opinion and that attitude about God. Now, you get to be a teenager, and you're like, man, my dad, he can't do nothing, right? Or he won't let me do nothing. Too many people in the church have that attitude about God. And I don't get to do this, I don't get to do that. None of this works out. Man, you know, I want to grow up and not be anything like my dad, right? That's how a lot of teenagers are. Jesus says you have to be like a little child in order to be great in the kingdom of heaven. You see the parable of the lost sheep, okay? Man has a hundred sheep, he loses one. What's he do? Say, well, that's life. We'll go on. Lost my sheep. No big deal. He goes out and finds them. Every member of the church counts. And every single person counts. You see how to deal with your brother, okay? Okay. Now look at chapter 19, verse 1. What do we see? When he'd finished these sayings, there's the end of the church sermon. And he begins explaining how the church operates. He talks about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. He has the rich young ruler. He has the workers in the vineyard and things such as that. Now we come to our last sermon. I think it's our last sermon. 
And it's the eschatology, which is a fancy word for last days, right? We enter into chapter 23. <coughs> you have the woe chapter. Woe to those who have been teachers but have failed in their job. And he comes through and he says, they're like whitewashed tombs. They're beautiful on the outside, but you look inside that coffin, what do you see? A rotting body. Something which life has passed from it, which is returning to its roots. He said, they're like a cup. You see a beautiful cup, but it's not cleaned. And you look inside and it's nasty. And he says, that's the way these people are. They look religious on the outside, but God sees their heart and it's horrible. And so as he sees these things at the end of chapter 23, he says, Woe to them, how I wish to gather Jerusalem under my wings, protect them like a hen. But you would not. And so they come to him in chapter 24 and they say, Listen, Jesus, you know, here you are in a temple. Look how beautiful this temple is. And he says, I tell you, there's coming a day soon where not a single one of these stones will still be sitting on one another. And so they come to him and say, Well, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of the end or the, of your coming? Two different questions. Now, a lot of people think it's one question, and that's what messes us up with prophecy. Notice when you look in chapter 24, from verses 1 through verse 35, okay? You see the word days. So you get the S on the end. In those days, right? Notice as you start in chapter 1 and go through verse 35, you see physical things which are happening. And what does he say when these things happen? Run, right? Pray that you're not pregnant. Pray it's not on the Sabbath so the gates are open. Pray that there'll be a time in which you can get away. Now, when the Lord comes, is it going to do you a lot of good to run? Okay. Does it matter if he comes on the Sabbath? Well, no, because the Sabbath is no longer in effect. So chapter 1 through 35 is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And so you read verses 1 through 35, you see from Christian writers, they understood this. And they ran to a city in the mountains named Pella. And New Testament Christians that were not destroyed in AD 68 to 70. What happened is beginning in 66, the Zealots came to power. Remember there's Simon the Zealot, one of the apostles. And they started a rebellion against Rome, which was great. Because all the legions were over in Persia fighting. And so when there's no policeman, there's no army, you can rebel and things go well. Well, Vespasian, who was emperor, and Titus, who was his son, came back. And in 68, they began to surround the city of Jerusalem. This is not good, right? And so they saw the legions coming. <coughs> Christians read verses 1 through 35, and he ran away. Vespasian went to become emperor. Titus finished the job. They wiped out Jerusalem, killed almost a million people, and carried the rest away as slaves and destroyed the Judaistic religion. Wiped it out. All right. I have a question. Yeah, go right ahead. About the destruction of Israel and the death of all those people. Yes. You mentioned in the Bible that there was so much killing that the, the blood in the streets was up to a certain height on the horse's leg. Uh, well, the question is, is, there, is it mentioned in the Bible that there would be so much death in the street that there would be blood on a horse's legs? Uh, Ezekiel talks about that. I don't think he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem when he brings that up. But sometimes it'll be brought up. Okay. So sometimes that'll come across. Now, uh, Josephus talks about Passovers and there being that much blood. But that was due to the sacrifices going on during the Passover. A lot of times that was what was happening there. But there was a great destruction which went through at that time. Now, starting in verse 35, but at that day, no hour, no man knows, not even my Father who is in heaven. And you'll begin starting at that point, and notice from 35 to the end of the chapter, we go from the word days, D-A-Y-S, to the word day, D-A-Y. And you see that there's coming a time when there's not going to be a warning. Coming a time when one will be in the field and the other one not. One will be taken, the other one not. Becoming a, that will be a day when there are weddings, when there are funerals, everybody is doing everyday life, everything is absolutely normal. God will come at a time when you do not expect. That's talking about the second coming. So chapter 25 explains how you and I get ready for the second coming. Well, how do we get ready? First parable, parable of the wise and foolish virgins. 
says you get ready by preparation. There are five wise, five foolish, right? The five wise have oil. The five uh, foolish do not have oil. The uh, bridegroom comes an hour you do not expect. The foolish ones say, hey, give us all your oil. There's some things you cannot share. No matter how hard you try, I cannot give my faith to somebody else. No matter how hard I try, I cannot give my obedience to somebody else. I love my kids, but they will make their decision of being faithfulness or being faithful to God on their own. So the first thing you do is you have to get ready. Okay? The next parable. The next parable is talking about getting busy, right? Well, Jesus comes, let's see. What is it, next parable? It starts in verse 14. Anybody there? Chapter 25. Talents. That's what it is. Talent back at this time was gold. All right? It was a measure of money. A, a man leaves his uh, servants behind. He gives one five, gives one two, gives one one. Right? One one. Is that right? Okay. All right. The man with five goes and he does what? Gets five more. The man with two goes and he gets two more. The man with one is scared because he knows he's going to be in trouble. He hides it so he won't lose it. All right? Do we see people that way today? Why do, why do we not tell other people about Jesus and invite them to church? We're scared to death about what their reaction is going to be. Why do we have a lot of men who do not participate in church and do not participate in leadership in church? I'm scared to get up there. I'm scared of what other people think about me. Why do we have a lot of people who do not use their talent for God? They're scared, okay? So the man with five is rewarded with five more. The man with two is rewarded with two more. The man with one is cast out because God says you're not worthy because the blessings I've given you were not used, all right? So the first parable, get ready, get prepared. The second one is get busy. There's no such thing as a lackadaisical Christian. You need to be active in the kingdom. Now, starting in about verse 33 and going to the end chapter, about 44 or so, if I'm not mistaken, you see, get compassionate, right? I was in prison and you visited me. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. The sheep said, Lord, we never saw you. And Jesus said, when you did it to the least of these, you also did it to me. Jesus says, I was hungry, you never gave me anything to eat. I was thirsty, you never gave me anything to drink. I was in prison, you never came to see me. And they said, well, Jesus, we would have fed you if we'd known that was you, but we never saw you. And Jesus said, when you did not do it to the least, you also did not do it unto me. What's that teach us? When you care for somebody, who are you truly caring for? The Lord, right? That is something we've got to remember. So chapter 25 opens up and says this is how you get ready for that second coming. You've got to obey the gospel and be prepared before he shows up. You have got to use your talents for God. He's given you blessings. You need to use those blessings in the right way. And he says and you need to be compassionate for others and care for other people and help them through everything that they face. All right, the key term there, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but I came to fulfill them. All right, if you like to write in your Bible, some people do, right beside Matthew chapter 5 there, 517, Luke 24, 44. Okay, because this Matthew 517 is at the beginning of his career. And at this point, he says, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. All right, Luke 24, 44, Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, says, now look, I have now fulfilled the law, the prophets, and the writings. I have fulfilled them, and they are complete. Now, Jesus didn't come to take away the Old Testament and destroy it. He came to fulfill it. We've got four boys who are about to graduate high school. Woohoo! this week, right? We're going to honor them this next Sunday. They have started from kindergarten and gone all the way through to 12th grade, and now they're successful. Perhaps they will go on to college. Perhaps in the next 10 or 15 years, they'll get a job. All right, I'm kidding. Hopefully, they'll do it before then. But they have accomplished this. Now, after graduating... 
What would happen if next August they go back to Marshall County High School and sit down and act like they're about to go to class? What would be said to them? You got to get out of here. <laughs> this part of your life is done. You fulfilled the requirements. You have a high school graduation. We are done with you. You go somewhere else. That's what Jesus did to the old law. He fulfilled it. Now, when people say, hey, I still want to follow the Old Testament, what we say is, no, it's been fulfilled. It has been completed. It's no longer a functioning law because it's already done its purpose. We are finished with it. We are done. And so that's a key term there. The great Messiah, the great rabbi, the master teacher has come in and fulfilled Genesis, the Malachi, and now has brought us the new law and the new covenant. All right, let's look at the back. Look at some quick lessons here. Lesson number one. Jesus and his way is superior to every other way. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, how does our righteousness go past these folks? Scribes had the entire old law memorized. That is Genesis or Deuteronomy. They memorized it and wrote it every single day. So how does our righteousness exceed theirs? You probably haven't written a New Testament in the last week. I mean, maybe you have. How does your righteousness exceed theirs? Put it in your hearts and live it. Don't just know it. Yes, don't just know it, but live it. Excellent. Number two, this new way of Jesus... It is hard, 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 hard. But is it worth it? It is. Each and every day you live as a Christian, there's going to be a struggle. Because as uh, Paul says in Romans 7, that natural man, that uh, carnal man, has stuff he wants to do. And it's stuff that's not right with God. It is selfishness. You boil sin down, I think, almost every time it goes down to selfishness. I want to live the way I want to live. I want to be empowered, and I want to make myself happy. That's not the way of Jesus. Jesus says, enter by that narrow gate and that hard way that leads to life. Number three, the church is built upon the authority and the identity of Jesus Christ. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Uh, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 7. What's that passage say? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You listen to him. The church is established upon the authority and the identity of Jesus Christ. He is what matters. He is what rules. He is what we truly, truly care about. We see that in number four as well. Now number five, we have a responsibility. It's a responsibility sometimes we shirk, right? Looking at verse 18, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. All authority. He is the one in charge. Go therefore, he says, and make disciples. All right? Not just make Christians, make disciples. What's a disciple? A follower, okay? Make little Jesuses, I've heard it one time explained. Make people to look like Jesus. And how do you do that? You do it by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you do that by teaching them everything that Jesus has commanded. Now, as you go and do this work, always remember, always remember, I am with you always, even into the end of the age. All right, looking at this, what are some lessons we've learned from Matthew today? If you go home and your mom and dad, like I always do to my boys, say, what did you learn in class today? What are you going to say? Studied Matthew. Studied Matthew. Matthew. You have to live a Christian life. Right. You have to live a Christian life. Not just believe. Very good. Did everybody fill this out? Is that one or two? Okay. You didn't pick the hard songs, right? All right. Okay. What other lesson did you learn? Okay. We've got to, we can't fall short. It's going to be tough. 
Have you all heard the sermon thing about Matthew before, the five sermons? That's going to really pop out, especially to a person who reads this in the original language. And you'll run across uh, medieval writers who really, really want to put each sermon with a book of the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Sometimes they do well with that, sometimes not so well. But that really pops out, the Pentateuch of the Old Law, along with the rabbi, which is here. We didn't get into it because it's a little bit allegorical and a little bit of a waste of time, I think. But that's something they love to do. All right. Thank you for being here. And as I always said, don't run in the halls till your mama gets you. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks. Thanks. Hmm? I hope to. All right.